Hello, some beautiful wise quotations for you to enjoy. That's good. Give me ten of them. Two. Three. These two men were the ringleaders behind Britain's most notorious and violent prison riot. 25 years ago, nearly 2,000 inmates broke out of their cells and took over Strangeways Prison in Manchester. The world's media caught every moment of the rooftop siege. But what made Strangeways remarkable was that cameras had already captured the brutal conditions that existed inside the prison. A stark warning of what was to come. I'll tell you something, this place will go off, and when this place does go off, the roof will go, man. When this hidden world finally erupted, men died and hundreds were injured. Now, for the first time, the riot leaders, the inmates who followed them, and the prison officers who fought them, take us inside Britain's toughest prison riot. Strangeways Prison, Manchester. And so into a barred and unnatural world of 900 male prisoners and 140 male officers. A world without money or women or liberty. You've got to understand that the people who were training you probably joined the prison service just after the Second World War. And they were trained by people who joined just after the First World War. And they were probably trained by people who joined after the Boer War. So all the standards that applied were the standards that applied 50, 60, 70, perhaps 100 years ago. What were those standards, Dave? Discipline. Simple as that. My job was the same as any other officer, especially young ones. Keep your mouth shut, listen, watch and learn. Prison officers had to be there at 7 o'clock in the morning, not one minute past 7. If you didn't appear properly dressed, then you could be disciplined. It had a reputation, along with Wandsworth, as sort of being the last bastions of discipline in the service. Strangeways was Britain's largest jail. A dark star hidden behind vast Victorian walls in the heart of Manchester. The prison was designed on a Victorian design. If you were to look right down from the top of the rotunda, you would see the prison centre, which would be the hub of the wheel. Off that centre were the five wings, A, B, C, D and E. And those wings would house all the inmates on four different landings, A1, A2, A3, A4. And exactly the same with B wing, C wing, D wing and E wing. So you can stand on the centre of the prison and look down every wing and see everything that's going on. This is life in a local prison, as it actually happens today. In 1980, the hidden world of strange ways was revealed when a documentary team filmed life inside the prison. Call your name down. I want you to go down onto the way to and stand outside each cell. It was a mammoth of a place. It was kind of Dickensian. For a young boy, you know, 15 and a half, 16 years of age, it, it was quite gruesome. Black slip-on shoes, blue jacket, pinstripe. I was 20, you know, a small, young, 
young man. When you're a young offender, you go through the reception stuff. You're stripped and, you know, and the, you know, the, the, you know, they ask you to bend over and that and the exposure. Put your shirt right up on me. What's this scar for here? Stopped. Eh? Hey? Stopped. Mm. Everything in there was dark. It was frightening as well. It was frightening. It was known to the locals as the Big House. We are the only hotel in Manchester that is always a 100% full. I hope, I hope, it's off to where we go. The shovel and the big and the donkeys. I hope, I hope, I hope. I was very proud to work at Strange Ways. There's no tighter bunch than those people who work in an institution, and I found that to be very satisfying. But Strange Ways was struggling to cope with the rising tide of prisoners coming through the gates. Built for 900 men, Strange Ways now housed one and a half thousand. Undoubtedly, the pressures and tensions of imprisonment are increased when two or three men share this living space, a cell devised in the Victorian age for one man. We had a previous governor who uh, once labelled it as um, a human warehouse. He's right, really, it was a human warehouse. Three inmates had to share the toilet facilities in a cell, which was a chamber pot. Like a plastic bucket, right? With a lid on, if you're lucky, where you shit and you piss, and it's in your cell with you. It wasn't very nice if, you've, if you're wanting to defecate and your cellmate's, you know, in the cell and he has to experience the, st the stench of that. Seems absolutely barbaric. But in those days, that, that was normal. And you just accepted it and got on with it as a way of life. Prisoners were allowed just one hour's exercise a day. For the other 23 hours, the men were routinely locked back in their cells. Tension, anger, frustration. The added problem of overcrowding rising to alarming proportions has also increased the threat of insurrection. This is a Victorian prison in 1990 that's still acting and treating people like it's Victorian times. This place should be closed down because this nick is run by the screws. But I'll tell you something, this place will go off. And when this place does go off, the roof will go, man. Into this powder keg stepped an idealistic young governor, Brendan O'Friel. He had a reputation as a modernizer. The big issues were we had far too many prisoners and not enough cells, things for them to do. It makes people very depressed, very morose. It makes them very angry. Brendan O'Friel was a remarkable man, a man of deep convictions, of real spiritual experience, and a man who cared. The new governor was quick to spot the simmering tension that existed between prison officers and prisoners. You know, I was a bit of a bastard, to say the least sometimes. You know, I was volatile, I'd explode. Do you know what I mean? And I was hard work for them and sometimes, which sometimes you, you didn't even have to do nothing. Say like the 200 officers in strange ways, I'd say there's only 20 of them that were really bad. The others were all right, they were decent staff. They just went about the daily jobs, they didn't bother no one. But out of the sweater, they were bad apples. They were a little firm, and they used to come round beating people up. There was no abuse. Simple as that. No physical. And no verbal. It's hear no evil, see no evil, speak no evil, but, you know, some prison officers will have the courage to say what happens. Some won't.
prisoners on occasions can be extremely difficult, um, extremely objectionable, and staff are rightly, on occasions, very cautious about prisoners and sometimes get very cross about them. But O'Friel also discovered a culture amongst some prison officers that had no place in his prison. We had a club, a prison officers club, immediately outside the gate, which regrettably served uh, alcohol at lunchtime. It meant that in the afternoon there was the danger that some staff would return to duty having been drinking. And this would have two effects. One is it would probably affect their judgment a bit, and certainly it would aggravate prisoners. Well, yeah, they used to use my fists at times, but when that wasn't working, because they used to have their batons and stuff like that, we used to have a piss pot, so we used to throw that over them, full of piss and shit. And the new governor noticed that there were some prison officers who were openly racist. Some of the staff were wearing on their ties um, a little symbol um, that was regarded as racist. And some of them used to have badges with, like, uh, you know, you know, the gollywog off the jam jar on it and things like that. And, you know, it was just like, what is this place? I instructed that all those symbols be removed. That sort of behavior would not be tolerated. All of the prison officers were male, a situation O'Friel soon remedied. I remember my first day at Strange Ways and I was allocated B-Wing. And I was just stunned at how many prisoners there were just unlocked at the same time, marching down so disciplined. It's illogical to have female staff looking after male prisoners. We, we certainly had bumps and bangs as we introduced um, uh, change like that, you always do, but overall the, the, the effect was quite remarkable. If there was tension on the wing, if prisoners were going to fight, sometimes the females just being there calmed it down. Unlike previous governors, Brendan O'Friel made it his business to get to know prisoners. It was a little bit different. He'd openly chat to a prisoner. If a prisoner came to him and said something, he'd, he would actually chat to them on the sensor, which, as officers, we found a little bit strange, I must admit. I knew about Brendan O'Friel. I'd had a conversation with him on the central rotunda one day. Just by chance, he was passing, and I engaged him in conversation. I was trying to persuade Paul that there were um, opportunities for him to go to work, because he was a sentenced prisoner, and um, I was trying to get all the sentenced prisoners in the main prison doing some sort of activity for at least half a day. Paul Taylor was serving three years for checkbook fraud and handling stolen goods. I grew up in Birkenhead until the age of seven and a half, and my mother had a breakdown, and from the age of seven and a half, I was in care homes. He'd been in and out of prison since the age of 15. Now nearing the end of his sentence, Brendan O'Friel was keen to prepare Taylor for life outside. It's where I come to contemplate life. The rocks in Birkenhead Park. I like schooling, you know, um, the power of the written word. This is a rock I imagined when I'm sat on those rocks over there, that this is a lecture hall and that this is Aristotle or Plato or Socrates giving me a lecture. Welcome to Strange Ways, first of all. The governor of Strange Ways today admitted he'd initially been daunted by the arrival of prison inspectors, but his fears were largely unfounded. O'Friel's approach began to pay off. Strange Ways got a good report from the chief inspector of prisons. When it came out, I was extremely pleased because he did the two things I wanted. First of all, he praised what we had done so far, but he also pointed out we had a very long way to go and we were in serious need of major capital investment. Despite O'Friel's progress, 
Strangeways was still taking in more and more prisoners. In February 1990, Alan Lord, a convicted murderer with a fearsome reputation in the prison system, arrived at the jail. Alan Lord was a life sentence prisoner, and as a life sentence prisoner, you always uh, treated these people warily um, because uh, they were in for a capital offence. Lord had been moved from prison to prison. I knew him because of his history, a violent prisoner, bodybuilder, potential to be very dangerous. Lord knew strange ways. He'd begun his life sentence there, and he bore a grudge. I was 19 years of age. Just as I was entering the cell, one of the screws punched me in the back of the head and said, you're murdering black bastard. I decided that once that door was opened again, I was coming out fighting. I took it on myself to literally no matter what cell I was in, smash hell out of that cell. I never had own comforts, never had a bed frame, I never had a mattress. I lived in an empty cell, slept on the floor. Why did you do that? Because it's me taking control. Inevitably, Lord was sent to D-Wing's segregation unit for difficult prisoners. Back in the main prison, Brendan O'Friel pushed on with repairs to the aging jail. It was like a, a menagerie in the evenings and nights because we'd got birds that had got through, uh, broken glass, uh, etc. And uh, it was becoming an issue. 20 tons of scaffolding was erected through the jail's central rotunda, creating a vast climbing frame that rose up to the fourth floor. Made it difficult to see into the wing, even though there was electric light, it still made it dark. And I felt that those, this, this darkness was reaching everyone within the prison. That month, even more prisoners arrived. Strangeways was bursting at the seams. We had 900 or so places, we had 1,600, 1,700 prisoners. That was the reality, day in, day out. That is pretty appalling. For Paul Taylor, prison conditions were now intolerable. I'd written to the Home Office an 18-page representation. The prison service was negligent in addressing its duty of care to address prisoners' problems and didn't feel I was getting anywhere. Taylor's frustration boiled over. He began to talk openly of revolt. I wanted personally to demonstrate to prison officers and prison governor in particular that prisoners had reached the end of their tether. Taylor was sent to the segregation unit to cool off. It was there that he first met Alan Lord during their one hour of daily exercise. We were able to walk side by side. We just magnated towards each other, like we're on the same wavelength. We said that people have to stand up for the rights because this cannot be the situation in this century. Together, they hatched a plan. And I said that a 24-hour protest in the chapel would be great if everybody stuck together. The chapel was the one place in strange ways where large numbers of prisoners were allowed to gather. I was going to make a statement on the stage and uh, if prison officers came in in force to try and break it up, we might retaliate. It was very quiet. It was eerie that night. When I was doing my rounds, the occupants were wide awake, just laid on top of the bed, which was unusual, you know, but 
They're usually asleep. Through the windows, prisoners were talking about what they was going to do the next day. And we was going to go to the chapel and have a peaceful protest. On the Sunday, I was late for the first time in my life. When I arrived, the senior officer said to me, we're short-staffed, uh, I'm putting you in the chapel as extra staff. So I thought, well, at least I've not got a rollicking. They showered for church, so I'd done my bit of cleaning what I had to do. And um, line got in line for church. By 10 o'clock that morning, more than 300 prisoners had filed into the chapel. When the prisoners came in, there was a certain amount of tension. I was seated at the back because I was on the punishment cells. So the punishment cells, and the category A's, we all sat together at the back. Well, Noel started the service and uh, everything was going sort of pretty well. I was enjoying the service. I, I, I invited an army chaplain in and I enjoyed his uh, testimony. I think he was, I think he was preaching from St Paul's Gospel, something like that, and he was calling them all sinners. And I thought, just, just get off, mate, you know, quick. Suddenly, uh, Paul Taylor got to his feet and ran from halfway up the chapel down the steps, and rushed to the where the choir had their microphone, and grabbed it and, and uh, began to harangue the audience. Prisoners had reached the end of their tether, that they'd had enough. That they, they weren't willing to put up with barbaric treatment by prison officers anymore. I distinctly remember an old proctor waving his arms about in front of the altar, like, come on, lads, cool down, this is not the way to behave. He started pulling on the microphone lead to try and disconnect us. I pulled it so hard that I hit myself in the eye with it and gave myself a lovely black eye. I saw an inmate put a balaclava on, take two chair legs, out of his jeans, and I thought, game on, here we go. And then he just said, right, lads, we've heard enough. And the whole place just... Everyone just started going mad. Anything that could have got damaged was getting damaged. Everything was in a pile, in the middle, kind of thing, like a bonfire. It was payback time. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but, you know, you kick a dog down, eventually going to bite your back, and that's exactly what they were doing. All we could do was hand it over to God and say, Lord, you're in charge here, you sort this out. I remember pulling one colleague out by his trousers and he said, they've got me keys. And I said, forget your keys, mate, let's just get out. And I said, I'll have those keys. And we opened the back of the chapel doors and we flooded out onto the landings and prison officers weren't up for the fight. They just ret retreated. In strange ways, all cells were opened by a single set of keys. Paul Taylor now had access to the whole prison. I opened up all the prisoners who were still locked up in their cells, saying, exercise, you know, slap out. My intention now was go to the rotunda where there was construction going on with the scaffolding from the ground floor up into the top of the roof, which was 80 feet, and my intention was to get on the roof. So I managed to scale across to the end. And uh, eventually when I got to the end, I stood up. It was like, wow, look at this. Look how vast it is. Oh, it's beautiful. 
It's a beautiful place, Manchester. You know, so happy. You see the Arndale, the CIS building. This was like me now being released. I thought, I'm on the roof here. I feel safe. I happened to see the bell. So instinctively, I went, I'm getting the bell down. I smashed hell out of it, put a load of dints in it. And when I've had any fun with that bell, I threw it off the roof, so there's your bell back. <laughs> and I remember shouting down, who's got your prison now? I've got your prison. News is coming in of a major disturbance at Strangeways Jail in Manchester. Inmates are believed to have stormed the prison chapel and they're now set to be rampaging through the jail. Within a matter of minutes of the prisoners reaching the roof, the riot had become a national event. I rushed up to the gate and discovered I couldn't get in because of these hails of slates that were coming off the roof. They were throwing tiles, just like frisbees. They were throwing them at staff, they were throwing them all over the place. There was a few staff who were quite badly injured. Number one staff got a piece of slate through his jaw. There was chaos going on because prisoners were just frantically letting off steam. They were pushing coping stones off the top onto the control centre. So it Cameras couldn't see what was happening inside the prison. Housed on E and C wings were inmates charged or convicted of sex offences. Rioters ripped doors off their hinges to get to the men. People were saying these are nonsense, these are sex offenders, you know what I mean? And they, they, were, they were just beating them. And they'd have them in like, there was a cupboard that was like a freezer. Uh, and they'd have them in there, and they'd have them locked in there, and they were bringing them out one at a time. I'd seen a few of them hit with iron bars. It was just like a wild pack doing things, and people were just joining in. I want to locate a particular prisoner who had come in that week for attacking a six-year-old girl, attempted rape of a six-year-old girl. And we went up onto that landing, and we found the cell that he was in. And we entered that cell, and I did punch him twice and prisoners set about him with sticks and he was dragged from the cell and his face was pushed into the railings and then he was picked up and thrown over the railings. But he grabbed hold of the railings um, so intensely that it required, you know, hitting his fingers with, with, with a stick for him to let go. Tables, chairs, everything went over on top of him. They were all enjoying it and getting off in it, and no one felt bad about that at all. Badly injured and fearing for their lives, prisoners dragged themselves to safety. And this inmate was actually thrown out uh, at the end of A Wing uh, onto the stone steps. He'd been beaten up in such a way, maybe his private parts or whatever. I don't, he was in such a state. Uh, there was blood all over the place. When that prisoner was lying on the floor in the state he was, he was still being bombarded by other inmates off the roof. By that afternoon, worried relatives joined bystanders flocking to Strangeways desperate to get messages into the prison. I want him to get out of that prison. I want him to get out because there's going to be a load of killing. I can feel it in my bones. Listen, Jeffrey, whatever's going on in there, don't have nothing to do with it at all. You just get yourself to the nearest door and get yourself out of there, laddie. By the end of the day, 1,000 men had fled the riot and surrendered. As we started to see that 
the numbers inside were dropping, we thought it was time to explore whether we could get any of it back. I then met Brian Nicholson, who was taking control of the situation. Brian was immense in stature and immense in character. He's a Yorkshireman, and you could always tell a Yorkshireman, but you can't tell him much. My assessment was it was very serious indeed, and it was going to be a very, very difficult and complicated job taking this prison back. Brian Nicholson had witnessed earlier riots at Hull and Risley prisons. Before he could mount an assault on strange ways, he needed to know just what resistance he was likely to face. The plan was to enter from the hospital onto Ewing, go up onto the ones, twos, threes, and fours landings, and clear the landings as we had the staff to do that. At eight that evening, the riot squad entered Ewing. The power had been cut that day by prisoners. Strangeways was completely dark. I was on the roof and the call went out that they're trying to get into Ewing. We managed to get onto the landings quite well. But waiting above them on the wire mesh were dozens of prisoners. Armed with scaffold poles, they'd taken from the central rotunda. Then all of a sudden, it just broke loose, yeah? Prisoners filled the wire and were driving the scaffolding poles, were driving them through the wire down onto us. Some of the scaffolding poles that are going, getting launched through the net and at them, uh, hitting the shields, buckling them, smashing through the legs, causing a lot of injuries to them. I think they were trying to kill us, no doubt about it. I think they would have liked to have killed us. I wasn't personally brandishing anything. I was just stood there with my hands behind my back, watching proceedings. Paul Taylor, I just seen is he's, this guy is completely eccentric. He'd have like a pen and a rose, and he'd start quoting Shakespeare. He was like a romantic anarchist, I should say. <laughs> The next thing that came along was buckets of urine and uh, excreta. I got you know, into my face, in my nostrils, into my mouth, and pop everywhere. So we knew what we was going to be up against, and it was going to be quite a uh, violent response if that was anything to go by. In fact, a very violent response. But we could manage it. After more than 20 hours of disturbances at Strangeways Jail in Manchester, up to 250 inmates are still on the loose in five of the ten wings. The second day, I thought I was dreaming. I thought I was dreaming all this. And when he opened one eye, it wasn't a dream. It was real life. It's known that more than 50 people were injured yesterday, but reports of up to 12 deaths are still being described as speculation by the Home Office. I was taken aback by that because I thought, that's wrong. That's wrong. We checked to see if anybody had been hanged or anybody had been killed. So we put a banner up on the roof saying, you know, no dead. But the rumours of dead inmates persisted and the world was watching. The pressure grew on Brendan O'Friel to act. My idea was to, let's get, let's get this ended. Uh, let's get back in control. Overnight, hundreds of prison officers trained in riot control had arrived in Manchester. The plan that I suggested was the main force would actually go through the chapel as a diversion, other units would go along Ewing to take the landings, which we could do quite easily. The helicopter was going to sweep the roof, forcing the inmates to lie flat. Next phase would be to get from the landings onto the wire. The prison officers were then going to go up through the roof space internally, retake the roof. 
we're still very uncertain about all sorts of things, but nonetheless, prison services let me have 400 staff, all kitted up. Um, well, unless they're going to just stand there and do nothing, um, what are they there for? It was all lined up inside the prison, down the side of the hospital, all in units, ready to march into the prison. At two o'clock, O'Friel got a call from Brian Eames, deputy head of the prison service. He was worried about casualties. I said to him quite bluntly, look, um, we've had a full-scale riot, we're still in a riot situation. Um, I can't rule out the possibility of casualties. I was on the roof and I saw a mass of prison officers coming through the gatehouse into the wing section. Some people got prepared with big, huge buckets of scaffold and clips. People were making makeshift shanks. No one to the end of a scaffolding pole, they were putting a knife in, getting a hammer, and putting it down like a big medieval instrument. I would have fought to the death. Because if I thought one of the officers was coming to save me, I would have defended myself. Brendan O'Friel then received another urgent call from Brian Eames. He pressed me further and said, could staff be killed? I said, well, it's possible. That's the situation that we're in. He then said, it's not on then, is it? What? You must withdraw. The governor and all of us were absolutely deflated. We could not believe that order. Yeah, well, um, uh, I was certainly um, thrown by it. I think the expression that several people used was polaxed. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, you just had to carry on. Well, morale dropped through the floor. You see, the prisoner being taken over and it didn't belong to them, it belongs to us. Everyone was elated. Everyone was chanting. You know, it was like everyone was laughing at them. I remember a speaker getting brought up on the roof, a big speaker out of the church. There was a song on at the chart at the time, Snap, We've Got the Power, you know what I mean? And people were playing it full blast. It was like a party within the prison. It was a campfire atmosphere. It was like being on a camping holiday. It's a complete release of all the stresses and worries and anxieties that, that you're actually feeling safe amongst this big, crazy storm. no longer a riot, it's a siege. Dawn this morning and the powerful beam of the police helicopter overhead 
picks out prisoners on the rooftop. Still With the world's media now camped outside the walls of Strangeways, Paul Taylor and Alan Lord were centre stage. He couldn't be too lax about it, he couldn't be too jovial about it, because then the whole incident becomes trivial and nonsensical. And that's what it wasn't about now. This was a golden opportunity to actually put under the microscope the prison system. This prisoner claims he started the protest, but says we didn't want a riot. At no time did anyone have any willful intention in respect of the very fact a riot situation developed. I just wanted the, the public to know that prisoners' treatments at the hands of the prison service was immoral. I wrote a seven-page representation and I went onto the rooftop and I started broadcasting it. And I got four pages into it. And then they started drowning me out with sirens. And I thought, OK, so you can play clever here. And I thought of the classroom and I went down to it. I ripped off the blackboard, found the chalk, went back up. There's nothing they can do now. The message is getting out even, even worldwide now. It's not about that now. It's about pen on paper, but chalk on blackboard. One of the things I took upon myself to do, right, was go to the governor's office. And I found two books in that office, and one was the Stoppage of Letters book. The book detailed letters that had been stopped by the prison's censor department. And what it was, Young prisoners getting a, a beating, a slap round the ear off a screw. So he's complaining to his family. There was a camera crew across the way, and I held up the book, the front cover, so he put his thumbs up like that. Then I'm quoting chapter and verse on the board for the rest of the press. Lord and Taylor's grievances were now being heard far beyond the prison walls. This isn't a, a case uh, of uh, prisoners going on the rampage uh, and uh, uh, destroying their own property. It's a case of prisoners going on the rampage and attacking fellow uh, prisoners. There's no modern sanitation in the cell blocks and men, even living three in a cell, are required to slop out. If we treat men like animals, we ought not to be surprised that they behave like animals. But for some of the younger prisoners, the rooftop protest had started to lose its appeal. Well, there was another young kid from my estate called uh, Matthew, and um, he was up on the roof with me and that. Yeah, he kept me head together in there, as I kept his head in, you know, you know, helped each other. It was getting cold, it was raining, I was tired. There was nothing else to wreck, so I thought, we might as well go. The problem for them was how to get off the roof. There was lads with balaclavas on saying, you know, we, we need to keep the numbers up. People in for serious crime, murderers. I wasn't about to argue with someone in a balaclava. I was scared, you know. With a lot of young prisoners, uh, we felt we were at risk with the older prisoners um, of abuse. We needed to try and get them down. Prison officer Pete Hancocks was also a trained negotiator. He contacted Alan Lord and asked to meet him away from the cameras. It was decided that somebody has to go down, people have to go down to negotiate. I said, you can negotiate with them, Alan, because I'm not negotiating with the prison service. They don't listen to reason at the best of times. And I'm not going to waste my energy. I dropped down from the wire mesh onto, the, onto that landing bridge. And um, you could cut the atmosphere with a knife. Is this the moment they're going to snatch me? Alan Lord was led to a negotiating room where he met with Pete Hancocks. It was very brief, it didn't last more than five minutes, but the main thrust of the argument is, what's it about? It's about conditions. 
But their main concern was about the YPs, the young prisoners. Look, you've got a lot of young lads up here, youngsters of 16 or 17. Do you want to be held responsible for what might happen to them? Lord agreed. He'd tell the younger prisoners it was safe to leave. As we were walking in back, there was a lot of hard feelings from our staff saying, you've just taken somebody off there, and you're taking him back up again. We had to build trust, not just with Alan Lord, but with the other inmates. I just stood in the middle of the rotunda and I shouted at the top of my voice and it went quiet relatively and I just said, anybody who wants to leave can leave. Nobody's forced to stay in this incident now. Within hours, Several young inmates made their way off the roof. I didn't go around telling everyone goodbye, goodbye. I just got off. Me and Matthew went down. So as I was climbing over, he went, wait for me. And then we both surrendered that, um, that Friday evening. Fewer than 25 prisoners are left on the loose tonight in the ruins of Strangeways Jail. The authorities say those that are left are the hard core of the hard core. As the siege continued, the nation remained hooked on the unfolding drama from both sides of the prison wall. Tell Paul Taylor his mother's here when he come down. My mother came to Berry New Road and called up, but we couldn't really hear. I said to my mother, I cannot end my protest whilst people want to protest. What's it been like for you coming here every oh, day to see? I couldn't tell you what it's been like. It's been terrible. The stress has been awful. I see me mum anxiously, you know, going to, you know, like different broadcasting vans that were outside the prison. Yeah. To be honest with you, I didn't feel too good about myself, about what I'm doing. I just think I'm adding to the worry again. What message would you give him if he gets to a radio? Oh, John, come down now while it's daylight and everybody's here. I don't want to see you distressed. So the way of changing that is to come down. But to come down to what? Some screws were just openly in all the riot gear just saying to us that when you come out of here, you're fucking dead. Trouble at other prisons, like Cardiff yesterday, is undoubtedly copycat. News of the riot had reached other prisons. Things were starting to get out of hand. I was sent to this prison for the kicking! Day 13 of the siege, and a hardcore of 10 prisoners remained on the roof. A change in strategy was needed. By this time now, the psychologists had moved in. They decided that it'd be a good idea if they uh, get these female officers. So they'd be shouting up towards uh, Alan Lord and be saying, Alan, Alan. I love you, Alan. Alan, I love you. Paul, Paul, I love you, and all that, and acting stupid, more or less. We were cooking bacon, so we'd get the smell of the bacon coming up to them and, uh, and they'd think, oh, that bacon smells lovely, we'll give ourselves up. You know, when we had plenty of food anyway. Then you uh, no, know, I wasn't going to. I think staff were quite happy because they ended up with a bacon sandwich. <laughs> hey. The siege was now three weeks old, the longest in Britain's penal history. With seven men still inside the prison, the governor looked to his newest members of staff for a breakthrough. Well, negotiating skills are very much about having good verbal ability, being able to get close to the other person, empathy. He said, we need a female to go and speak to them. And he said, you know them all. The man Lisa John knew best was Alan Lord. 
We'd heard rumours that he was actually sleeping on the landings with a noose around his neck. If the staff had tried to enter the prison, he was going to throw himself off the landing. Lord was the linchpin to regaining the prison. Brendan O'Friel ordered a squad to recapture him. So we're waiting in the cell now, four of us. All this riot gear on, with shields and everything. And there was actually um, some bathing on the roof. John John called down, he said, the, um, Lisa Jones wants to see that Ewing girl, talk to you. I'll never forget his words as I was making my way down towards Ewing. He said, just be careful, lad. I said, oh, I'll be all right, don't worry. I'm thinking about how's he going to fight? Is he going to give us a, a good fight? And we're going to struggle with him. Big, powerful man. I've dropped down onto the ones. And I must admit, through my own complacency, I, I, didn't, I didn't see it straight away. And he went to the gate to speak to the negotiators. So off we went. We're off out. And I'm looking over and then I see you know, groups of screws all together in riot gear come and rush them. And I ran at them, hit them, hit the shields and all that. Um, within seconds, they got hold of me, wrapped me up and... That was his moment of glory had gone now. I just got up to the roof that quick and let the lads know. We have succeeded in returning one more prisoner to legal custody. Alan Lord was gone. The men left on the roof went on the rampage. Strange Ways was ablaze this afternoon. Large fires started deliberately in the jail sea wing by rioters infuriated by the governor's announcement that one of their leaders had been captured. I was upset that they'd taken him the way that they did. You know, that Alan had been captured when he was a negotiator. Having set the jail on fire, they attacked the fire crews called to tackle the blaze. Early this evening, a prison van left Strange Ways, carrying Lord to another prison in the north of England. Lord's capture meant Brendan O'Friel now had the support of the prison service to retake Strange Ways. We'd certainly got the number of staff that we needed, and we'd certainly got a very clear authority that, you know, you could do it. The operation to take back the prison began at 9 in the morning on April the 25th, 25 days after the riot started. Units would go in on different parts of the wing. Some would enter via the end of the wing, some would enter via the chapel. Twenty-three minutes later, the riot teams had reached the prison roof. They just come along every wing, all angles, and they burst through the roof. We broke the roof out, we're chest high. What are you gonna do now? But with prison officers ordered not to risk their lives by climbing onto the roof, it was stalemate. Taylor displayed more antics from his repertoire. He appeared to be suggesting he could fly to freedom, but it was a lost cause. John, John! John, John, come down, son! Then we were just cornered. Did you get me? spectator event, apart from anything else, there are literally hundreds of people gathered around the prison wall watching this remarkable event unfold. Hours into the final assault, the prisoners were still holding out. Taylor was still trying to mock the authorities, despite almost being knocked off the roof by a jet of water. Finally, at six that evening, the men made the decision. Now to Strangeways Jail in Manchester, live where the siege is ending as we speak. 
There was no surrender. We just actively responded to our family's wishes. Taylor agreed to come down, but only in full view of the television cameras. And there they are, into the bucket. As soon as I put my foot on that cherry picker, I just felt terror. And I just knew that there was going to be a huge price to pay, possibly for the rest of my life. And the five of them climbed in, and they were giving gestures to the press as if they were absolute bloody heroes. One of them he was saying, get that mask off that ghost bastard. Let's see his face, you know what I mean? I had to escort them into the police vans. I was still really angry, and something in me wanted to punch them in the face, but you can't do that. Prison staff described the destruction as phenomenal. These pictures show they were not exaggerating. It was sheer vandalism. It was, in my view, and I stand by that, an explosion of evil. It was as if our whole professional world had been taken away. I stood in the hub of the prison, was looked around, not just me, but two or three other staff were there, and we were in tears. and 47 prison staff and 47 inmates were injured during the riot. One of the prisoners, badly beaten by other inmates, died of a heart attack two days after he was rescued. A prison officer who was taken ill during the riots subsequently died in hospital. For his role in the riot, Alan Lord had a further 10 years added to his sentence. After 32 years in prison, he successfully applied for a government grant and now runs his own gym just a few miles from Strangeways. Despite the fact that they say that we rehabilitate you, that's a load of rubbish, you rehabilitate yourself as a human being. There's only one person going to change, and that's yourself. Paul Taylor was also sentenced to a further 10 years in jail. He now helps his father run a taxi service in Birkenhead. These are pages of quotations that I give out to people in my home area. What's your favorite quotation? Friendship is the one thing concerning the usefulness of which the whole of mankind is agreed by George Catlett Marshall. My family suffered, I suffered. From that point of view, it wasn't worth it. But I'm willing to sacrifice that, you know, part of my life to know that I've helped change the prison system. Quotations for you to enjoy. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Enjoy. Thank you.